Awesome. Hey, how's everybody doing? I've seen, I've, you know, I, I stayed in town the last uh, several weeks, so I saw some of your beautiful faces, uh, but I, I haven't seen everyone. You, you doing good? You feel, you feeling Christmassy? You feeling Christmassy, or is it, or is it still a little early? I was talking to Jerry the other day. We were golfing, and maybe that, that was the thing. We were golfing in at the end of November, and he was like, you know, it doesn't really feel like Christmas, and I was like, maybe that's because we're on a golf course right now, but. But I, I have to say, it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas. But here's the real question, okay? This is the, this is the real question that, that creates a great debate in my household every year. When does the Christmas season officially start? November the 12th. <laughs> November the 12th, okay. You're very passionate about that. Uh, and uh, like, I love Christmas, okay? Christmas is uh, my favorite time of year but unjustly, I get labeled as the Grinch in our household because I protest the Christmas tree coming out on Halloween night, okay? So, so some people like, like Keith here will say that Remembrance Day is when, you know, the day after is when Christmas really starts. Others will push it all the way back to December 1st. So when does the holiday season officially start? Well, believe it or not, I have definitive answers to the questions that you seek. So to put this to rest, a writer for the Washington Post, uh, his name was Christopher Ingram, took it upon himself to gather definitive data on the subject by charting Google searches for Mariah Carey's number one billboard hit song, All I Want for Christmas Is You. He argues that for many listeners, the song is quite literally the sound of contemporary Christmas. Now, he admits that, you know, just because people are searching the song doesn't mean that they're, they're listening to it, but that does indicate interest, okay? So I, without further ado, I want to present to you the All I Want for Christmas Index of Holiday Cheer. You could put that up. There we go. So uh, that blue line there is the average of the years 2006 to 2017. And you'll notice that there's a slight but noticeable upward trend starting around mid-September. And he suggests that some Americans start getting into the holiday spirit right around the start of fall. Perhaps those same insufferable people who always boast about having their Christmas shopping done by the end of September. As mid-October hits, you can see there is a noticeable decline there. That's about the time that stores began to stock their holiday items. And so this indicates that some people may give in to the temptation and listen uh, to Mariah uh, in their closets, okay? Become closet listeners of Mariah pre-Halloween. Mid-November, though, that's when things like really just shoot up there. Mid-November is when things really take off. And there's a really strong correlation uh, with Spotify data that shows that this is about the time that people get serious about Christmas music, with 2% of all streams on the service being Christmas music. And the number one track in the USA, you guessed it, All I Want for Christmas is You. Interest continues to climb uh, until December 25th, at which point it drops sharply before the new year. And in conclusion, this is, this is the data, okay? This isn't opinion. This isn't what people will tell you. This is the data. In conclusion, he writes, to return to our initial question, the aggregate numbers suggest there's a strong case to be made that the holiday season really starts in the run-up to Halloween when all I want for Christmas is you searches start to tick upward in earnest. So, I guess Mel is right. I am the Grinch. <laughs> one of many. You know, it's, it's absolutely amazing how one song grew to be associated with the very sound of Christmas, isn't it? But long before the 1994 release of, of All I Want for Christmas is You, we were singing the songs of Christmas. We sang one of them this morning, Hark the Herald, Angel Sings. And people have been singing that song um, for over 250 years. So I, I guess only time will tell if, if Mariah Carey's hit will make it that long. You know, it's, it's truly incredible that some of these familiar carols that we know and love have been sung for literal centuries. And they bring the sweet melodies of Christmas to our ears. You know, the, when, we, when we hear a Christmas carol, it makes us feel all, all warm and tingly and Christmassy inside. 
But seldom do we pause long enough to meditate on the words that we're singing. So, so often we go in on autopilot. And yet these, these classic carols are packed full of theology. They just stuff in as much as they can. It tells the, the timeless story of Christmas, and, and it gives us hope for today. And so this holiday season, I thought we would, would do something a little bit different. I thought it would be fun to come to the Christmas story through the songs of Christmas. And so I want to invite you to, to, pr- to pause and to reflect on these old familiar carols. And it, it's my prayer that as, as you sing these, these songs, that your heart would be uh, inspired and informed by the story that is told within. So you may have guessed it, since we sang the song this morning, we're going to be kicking things off with Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You know, the opening line is a call to pay attention to the message of the angels at Christ's birth. And these events are are recounted in Luke chapter 2, and so if you've got a Bible, you can can head over there. That's where we're going to be starting. If we want to understand the song, we need to start there. And while you're you're looking for that passage, I want to give you a fun fact. Uh, This carol originated as a poem written by Charles Wesley, a prolific songwriter who wrote over 6,000 hymns, um, which is a lot. You know, I, I think it's amazing. Sometimes we look at the hymns that have lasted and we're like, man, they don't like write songs like they used to. Well, I think they do. They just wrote 5,999 that didn't make it, but they wrote one that did. And the story, as the story goes, he was inspired by the bells on Christmas Day as he was walking to church. And the, po- the poem first appeared in a collection in 1739 with the opening line, Hark how the welkin or heaven rings. In 1753, Methodist pastor George Whitfield adopted this, the poem into the song that we know and love today. And he added the famous line, glory to the newborn king. So now that you know the story, let's take a look at the story behind the story in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And so with that, that image of that, that Christmas night, that first Christmas night in your mind, let's listen to the first verse of that familiar carol. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. I want to I wanna pause there for a second on the line, God and sinners reconciled. Now, the word reconciled means to restore a friendly relationship. And this is a really bold statement if you think about it, because it has three underlying prepositions, or presuppositions, sorry, not prepositions. I'm not talking grammar here. The first one is that at one time, God and people lived in a perfect, harmonious relationship. Right? In order to restore a relationship, it means that you had to have been in a right relationship at some time. And so the biblical story is that we were, were made to be in, in a perfect relationship with God, that we were made to, to commune with our Creator and to commune with one another, to, to, to love freely. The second presupposition is that something went horribly wrong, that somehow our relationship with God was broken and in need of restoration. 
That sin and death have entered the world and that a whole, and with it has come a whole host of tragedies and injustice and pain and suffering and brokenness. And finally, and most painfully, we have to look inwardly. We have to realize that we are the sinners. We are the ones at fault. It was our arrogance It was was in in our pride that we decided that we didn't need God and that we would be much better on our own. Thank you very much. And so there's this really sharp juxtaposition where where the, the, the songwriter puts the infinite, glorious God next to sinners. And this is illustrated beautifully on that first Christmas night with with the the glory of the angels, with the angels singing the praises of God over the lowly shepherds. And and shepherds uh, at that time, some of you will will know this, they were not an honored occupation. At that time, uh, they were considered spiritually unclean. Because of the, the nature of the work, they weren't able to participate in temple worship. And so spiritually, they were unclean. They also had a reputation for being rascals and being a little bit dishonest. They didn't necessarily brand their sheep, and so if they had the opportunity to grow their flock a little bit, they would. But I digress. Here's the question that we should be asking. If God and sinners have been reconciled, if the relationship has been restored, who restored the relationship? See, if there's a falling out between friends, if there's a falling out in in a marriage relationship, if there's a falling out in any kind of of, of relationship, a falling out with a parent or or, or a child or or whatever the case may may be, it's universally accepted that the one who caused the rift in the relationship, the one who caused the suffering, the one who, who, who crossed that line needs to be the first one to come back and make things right. But what if the damage was so irreparable that that's impossible? What if if nothing can be done or said to make things right? And this was the weight of our sin. That there was literally nothing that we could do to make things right. But here is the miracle of Christmas. God came to us when we should have gone to Him. He who had done no wrong came to us to restore the relationship that we had broken. See, the wonder is that God sent an army. Did you notice that? It was an army of angels. God sends an army, but not to enact justice, not to make us pay, but to bring a message of peace. He sends the armies of heaven to bring a message of peace on earth, goodwill to men. God and sinners reconciled. Right? And, and, and that's a paraphrase. What the angels actually proclaimed was peace on earth with those whom God is pleased. And it's really important to notice that God is the one who decides with whom he's pleased. That means that no amount of human effort, no amount of, of, of placating, no amount of, of, of kneeling or, or worshiping or, or, or doing good things or whatever it may be, none none of that is is what what matters. What matters is that God looks on us and he says, peace with whom I'm pleased. It is the free gift of God. It's his grace. So the message of God and sinners reconciled is for all who put their faith in Jesus. The gift of Christmas has a name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this brings us to verse 2. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come. Offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. This is my favorite line of the whole carol. God left the glories of heaven and he came to earth to dwell with us. You know, in John, first, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, So the word became human and made his home among us. 
He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. See, God sent his Son to be born of a virgin. The term Godhead refers to the doctrine of the Trinity. As followers of, of Jesus, we believe that God is three in one. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And yet, together they are one. And no one has ever seen God the Father. No one has ever seen God the Spirit. But in God the Son, He reveals the glory of all three in one. And it's important when we, when we think about the doctrine of the Trinity, we need to understand that this is a spiritual reality that, that we're, we're using to, to try to understand God. To try to understand the creator of the universe. And, it, and so it's important to understand this can't be fully rationalized and fully explained in human terms. It's a divine mystery that we must embrace. And when we embrace Jesus, we embrace the Godhead. The message of the incarnation, God veiled in flesh, is revealed in the message of the angels. They said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. See, the angel gives Jesus three different titles, crams them all in together, because the name of Jesus can't be described, like, like his, who he is and what he's done. It, it, it's so hard to put into a name. And so the angel uses three terms to really explain who this baby is. In the Old Testament, the God of Israel was known as the Savior. If you read the, the Old Testament, if you read the stories of, of Israel, God was constantly saving them from different calamities or captivities. Over and over and over again, God is seen as Savior. And at that time, the Jewish people found themselves in captivity again under Roman rule. And so they were no doubt looking forward to God, their Savior, to come in and save them once more. And so the term Savior at that time was also given to the Roman emperor. And so it, to, to, to people who would read, to non-Jewish readers who, who would later look at this message, they would not only have the idea of God the Savior, but they would also, in more human terms, have this understanding of here is this all-powerful being. This all-powerful emperor-like person. And so Savior created a connection to the God of Israel and the encompassing power of the ruling. And then we have the term Messiah or Christ. And this means anointed one, or specifically the anointed one. See, at various times in, in Israel's history, God the Savior would raise up different anointed people. And they would be the conduit for Israel's salvation, right? We think of King David, we think of Samson, we think of all of these heroes of the faith who, who God used powerfully to bring deliverance. But this night, the angels don't say that God is bringing an anointed. They say the anointed, the Messiah. The anointed one it is who is born. The one who was prophesied about over and over and over again in the Old Testament, in the centuries leading up to Christ's birth. The one whom it was foretold would be from King David's royal lineage. And that's why it's so important that the, the angel mentions that he was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And finally, the third term, the Lord. It could mean a couple different things. At the very least, this term refers to someone with ruling authority, someone with power, someone that, that needs to be obeyed. But it could also be a reference to Yahweh himself, the most sacred name of God. It was so sacred that the Jewish people wouldn't even say it out loud. And, and when you read the Old Testament and you see the word LORD in all caps, that's, that's to indicate that that is where the name Yahweh would be. And so, so at the very least, when, when you see the term Lord, it, it means that, that he's here to rule and reign. He's a king. But it could even be an allusion to God himself. 
being in that nature. And when you put all three of these together, when you put, put the, the Messiah, the Savior, and the Lord together, the meaning cannot be more clear. God has come in the flesh to save his people. That first Christmas, God left the glories of heaven and clothed himself in humility. And that's precisely what this final verse is about. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lay His glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. Mild He lay His glory by. See, the glory of Christmas is found in the very one who was and is glory, laying it down freely. The reason that the Christ child was to be found in a feeding trough was that there was no room for him. The grand reception of the Savior of the world, the grand reception of the Son of God, was met with shut doors and closed hearts. And, and even if you think about Jesus' life after preaching the good news, after performing countless signs and wonders, after lifting the, the burden of, of shame and, and the burden of religion off of people's shoulders, Jesus left just as he came, in humility, dying the death of a common criminal, abandoned and betrayed by his closest friends. God came to earth, and not only did we not welcome him, not only did we not recognize him, later we murdered him. And in return, he forgave us. With arms stretched wide, under the the crushing weight of our sin and shame, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then everything went dark for three days. But on that third day, he received the greatest glory of all glories. He rose again. He conquered not only our sin, he was not just the savior of our sin, but he also defeated the final enemy of all humankind, death itself. See, he who is everything became nothing so that we could share in his glory. I'm going to say that again. He who is everything became nothing so that we could share in his glory. In the wonder of the incarnation, glory is traded for humility. In the horror of his passion, honor is traded for shame. In the, the terrible beauty of the cross, life is traded for death. And in the glory of the resurrection, death gives way to victory. See, the greatest shame gave way to the most extravagant glory. And so the angels proclaimed, glory to the newborn king. Actually, what the angels said was glory to God in the highest heaven. George Whitfield flipped the script. See, in a, in a stroke of artistic genius, he turns our attention from the heavens from the abstract, from the out of reach, to earth, to the concrete and the familiar. See, the shepherds may have stared in awestruck wonder at the armies of heaven, but they ran to the manger. The newborn lying in that feeding trough is king, not just of heaven, but also of earth. And friends, it's my, my, my heart's Prayer, my my desire for us is that we would too would run to the manger this Christmas. The glory of Christmas is Jesus. The reason we celebrate Christmas in October isn't because Mariah Carey says it's time. It's not because Walmart says you need to buy things. It's because we have received the greatest love of all, Jesus. And so how do we respond? How do, you, how do you respond to this immeasurable love? Well, the answer is worship. The answer is, is, is overflowing joy from our hearts, thankfulness. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ 
is born in Bethlehem. And so we're going to sing that song again. Band, you can come on, come on up. And as we do, I want to encourage you to proclaim him in your heart. Proclaim him to all who will hear. The Savior of the world has come. And so let our, our hearts erupt in praise as we sing once more. Hark, the herald angels sing. Would you stand?